Welcome to worship on this Ash Wednesday. It is sad that we were unable to be together today, but weather had certain plans that prevented us from doing so. Because we were unable to have our imposition of ashes as we normally would, we would like to invite you on Sunday to receive the ashes as a sign of our penitence in this season of Lent on our walk to the cross. So for those of you who attend our modern service, it will be part of the service as has been our custom for the past few years now, our Ash Sunday as I refer to it. For those of you who attend our traditional service, you may uh, receive the sign of the cross in the form of the ashes following our traditional services uh, on February 21st. That's the first Sunday in Lent on February 21st. For now, we pray that this service is a blessing to you as we begin our Lenten walk to the cross with our Savior. God bless your worship today. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But But now, now, in these last last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He He was bruised for our iniquities. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the the author and perfecter of our faith. O come, let us fix our thoughts on Jesus, the the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The The Lord Lord has has laid on him him the iniquity iniquity of us all.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, author and, and perfecter, perfecter of, of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and, and is seated, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. O Father in heaven, our divine creator and sustainer, have mercy upon us. O Jesus Christ, our divine redeemer and Lord, have mercy upon us. O Holy Spirit, our divine sanctifier and keeper, have mercy upon us. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, by the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment. Help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, O Lord, to prosper the preaching of your word, to bless our prayer and meditation, to strengthen and preserve us in the true faith, to give heart to our sorrow and strength to our repentance. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to draw all people to yourself, to bless those who are instructed in the faith, to watch over and console the poor, the sick, the distressed, the lonely, the forsaken, the abandoned, and all who stand in need of our prayers, to give abundant blessing to all works of mercy, and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To turn our hearts to you, to turn the hearts of our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have have mercy mercy upon us. us. O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have have mercy mercy upon upon us. O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. us. O Lord, have have mercy. mercy. O Christ, have have mercy. mercy. O Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. O God, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. We beg you to have compassion on the frailty of our mortal nature, for we acknowledge we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Mercifully pardon our sins, that we may obtain the promises you have laid up for those who are repentant. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, 
so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Create in me a clean Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today on this Ash Wednesday, we begin our prayerful and penitential walk to the cross. Our thoughts and worship are focused on the passion of Christ, the sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we begin this spiritual walk through Lent, let us pause to consider our sinfulness both by nature, which we inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve, and our sins by choice, which we commit in thought word and deed, both knowingly and unknowingly. Let us spend the next few moments considering our own sinfulness in light of the Ten Commandments. Please kneel as you are able. The first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. In thought, do I fear, love, trust or think about anyone or anything more than God. In word, have I neglected my prayers to God in the morning, at night, or at meals? In action, have I always placed God first and foremost in my life and my own work and pleasures second? You shall have no other gods. The second commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. In thought, have I wished evil or bad things upon someone else out of anger for something they did to me? In word, has my conversation been mingled with profanity and cursing and words I would not say in church? Do I speak God's name without reverence or honor? In action, have I wished for good luck more than for God's help and blessing? Do I look for guidance from horoscopes, dreams, fortune tellers, psychics, or a Ouija board or the like? 
you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In thought. Have I thought lightly of God's word and his sacraments? Have I desired to stay at home rather than attend worship or Bible study or devotions in person? In word. Have I said bad things about my church, my pastors, my teachers, or leaders within the congregation? In action, have I skipped worship or Sunday school or my prayers and devotions out of convenience or because I wanted to sleep in, play, work, or do other activities instead? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The fourth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. In thought, have I despised or thought evil or bad things about my parents, my employer, or those in positions of authority or power in government? In word, have I purposefully said something to anger or disrespect my parents or employer, or have I said disparaging and harmful things about authority figures? In action, have I deliberately disobeyed or disrespected my parents, my employer, or those who are my lawful superiors? Honor your father and your mother. The fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. In thought. Do I secretly or openly hate someone and wish they weren't around? Or do I have bad thoughts about myself, my life, my body, or the way I look, even thoughts of suicide? In word, am I often quarreling, nagging, or teasing others in a mean-spirited way, especially those within my family, like my spouse, children, or parents? In action, Am I guilty of physically hurting myself or others? Am I guilty of drunkenness, gluttony, or any other excesses? Am I helping or ignoring people who cannot help themselves, like babies, the elderly, the disabled, or the poor? You shall not murder. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. In thought. Have I indulged in bad or dirty thoughts and lustful desires? In word, do I delight in hearing or telling dirty jokes and obscene stories? Do I enjoy and even feel an addiction to pornographic magazines, books, videos, movies, or websites? In action, have I knowingly committed a sexually unclean deed with another person or alone? You shall not commit adultery. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal. In thought, have I schemed or plotted to take someone else's belongings for myself? In word, have I misrepresented goods in either selling or trading in order to make a few dollars more or to cheat someone out of their own money? In action, have I taken something that isn't mine? Have I wasted time at work at my employer's expense? Do I regularly give and contribute money, time, and talent to support God's work in the congregation, or do I rob God? You shall not steal. The Eighth Commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In thought, am I holding any grudges against someone? Am I creating stories or lies in my head without talking to the person I'm angry with? In word, have I been so mad that I made a false accusation against someone or spoke misleading information about them? Or have I become so upset that I refuse to speak with someone at all? In action, have I purposefully engaged with others for the purpose of spreading lies about someone? Have I told the truth about someone in order to tear down their reputation? Have I listened to lies about someone without coming to their defense and correcting the lies? 
you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. The ninth commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. In thought, am I jealous or envious of others and their material possessions? In word, do I continually complain and grumble about what I do have and what I don't have? In action, have I tricked or cheated anyone out of something that rightfully belongs to them? You shall not covet your neighbor's house. The Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his cattle, nor anything else that is thy neighbor's. In thought, am I bored with my family or friends whom God has placed in my life? Have I day daydreamed about what it would be like to have other people's devotion and attention instead? In word, have I urged someone to be careless or unfaithful in their work or in their relationships in order to be with me instead? In action, have I tried to entice others from my neighbor to myself? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now that we have considered our sins of thought, word, and deed in light of God's Ten Commandments, let us confess our sins together before God and before each other. I confess to God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed, but some is known only to God. Wherefore, I pray, God Almighty, to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you pardon, pardon forgiveness, and remission of all your, your sins. Amen. I confess to God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned and thought word and deed, by, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed, but some is known only to God. Wherefore I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord does indeed grant you pardon forgiveness, and remission of all of your sins. Through the suffering and death of his only son, Jesus Christ, he has wiped away the dust and ashes of sin's curse and offers new life. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce God's grace to you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. We rest now in his peace and rise in the morning to serve him. Amen. Amen.
first reading for this Ash Wednesday is from Joel 2, beginning with verse 12. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering, and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. Make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you a grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. A reading of the Passion Narrative of our Lord. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also called the Passover, drew near. And Jesus said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man will be given over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the scribes assembled with the elders of the people in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted how they might take Jesus craftily and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. For they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, one of the twelve. He went his way to the chief priests and captains and spoke together with them how he might betray Jesus to them. They were glad to hear him. Judas said to them, What will you give me to betray him to you? They promised to give him money and agreed with him for thirty pieces of silver. Judas accepted, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray Jesus in the absence of the multitude. Then came the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? He said to them, Go into the city. And when you have entered the city, watch for a man bearing a pitcher of water. When he meets you, follow him into the house where he enters. You shall say to the man who lives there, The master says to you, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house. Where is the room for me to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They came into the city, and they found it, exactly as he told them, and they made ready the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus sat down with the disciples with him. As they were eating, he said, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not rest, I shall not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Truly I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine 
until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of my Father. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. pray with me. Great God in heaven, our our sin is real, and it is rotten, and it leaves us with with no escape. Uh, We have no hope of rescuing ourselves from our sinful condition, and you send a very real Savior, a Savior who sheds his blood for us, a Savior who dies for us, so that we might be forgiven, a Savior who then invites us into holy conversation with you to confess our sins and to hear your strong words of forgiveness to us. Help us not to neglect this conversation or or treat it lightly, but to see it as, as the power of God working through words of absolution spoken to our hearts in Jesus. Amen. Grace to you and peace in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. For our midweek worship during Lent, uh, starting here on Ash Wednesday, we're going to be diving into Luther's small catechism, especially the section on confession. That is, admitting and speaking our sins before God. And if you've done your memory commitment for the week, or maybe you've done it in years past, then you'll know that confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it, our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. So I'm going to start with a little quiz. I didn't prepare you for this one. And I am being super serious about this. I want you to answer out loud. Wherever you are, whoever you're with, these aren't trick questions. And I'm not asking anything super sensitive. So everyone, no matter how old you are, you should be equipped for this. Okay, are you ready to go? Here's the first one. What is this? I heard it. I heard it. That's right. A hot dog. Uh, Good. Uh, I'll show you one more. What is it? That's right, a swimming pool. I could even hear it in this room. Well done. Boy, confirmation questioning has gotten a lot easier than back in my day, am I right? Okay, from what I can tell, we're all two for two. So do you want to do two more? How about this? Huh, that's odd. 
Okay, okay. Now what about this? I know what you're thinking, and, and you're right. There, there seems to be something missing here. You told me that first picture was a hot dog with the hot dog and the bun together, and you told me that second picture was a swimming pool uh, with the swimming pool and the water together. I mean, I guess you're right, but it's still a hot dog without the bun. It's still a swimming pool without the water. We're just missing something from the full experience. When we say hot dog, we picture two things a hot dog and the bun. When we say swimming pool, we picture two things, a pool and the water. And so when the catechism teaches us confession, we picture two things, confession and absolution. Because confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins before God. And second, that we receive absolution. That is forgiveness. It's called confession but it really only works if you have both parts. Would you really want to eat a hot dog when you didn't have a bun to catch all the mess? Would you really want to spend the summer at the pool if it meant you were just sitting on the pool's concrete bottom? There's nothing refreshing about that. And it's the same with confession. Admitting and speaking our sins before God is a, is a good practice. It shows that we're being honest with ourselves that we can recognize our own faults and failures. But the real goodness in confession is how God responds. He responds with absolution. Your sins are absolutely gone fully and freely forgiven. This is how the Bible tells us God chooses to react to our confession. He hears us and he forgives us. Have you ever stopped to think how wonderful that is, that he hears us and that he forgives us? I mean, he could listen to our sins and say, oh, that's nice. Go and do better next time. He could listen to our sins and say, are you kidding me? You're going to be doing the dishes for a month, missy. You are grounded, mister. He could listen to our sins and walk away wanting nothing more to do with us. Because God is a holy God, completely without sin. And this holy God, he can't stand sin either. So he does something about it. Our holy God can't stand sin or to see his people suffering with it. So he sends a savior, not one who will insult us or even punish us for our sins, not to walk away from us, but a savior who himself will be insulted who will bear the punishment that was meant for us. A Savior who, instead of walking away, willingly walks to the cross. God's word tells us, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession has two parts, the confession part and the absolution part, because God built it that way. For God, confession isn't complete if it's not followed by us believing his forgiveness. Because if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pause for just a moment right now and reflect on the character of a loving God who's, who's ready to hear you confess your sins, each and every one of them, and is eager to cover them all with his forgiveness. So for this Lenten season, we are going to get serious about confession. We're going to be talking about what it means to honestly admit that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean. That we've sinned against God in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. And if you've been tracking with us, maybe this feels sort of like a detour from what we've been talking about. Because since New Year's, we've been talking about baptism. 
in confirmation class, in our Sunday morning adult Bible study. We've been talking about baptism and how that is 100% good news for us. Our sin and our shame are drowned. We are freed from sin, born again into the kingdom of Christ and united with him forever in his death and resurrection. When you think about your baptism, it should make you smile. It is 100% good news. But now, Pastor, we're going to spend six weeks talking about sin. How am I supposed to feel about that? Well, how do you feel about that? Because acknowledging our sin can drive us to shame. It can make us feel bad about ourselves. It can make us feel like we're no good, like we're worthless. And all of that is real. But what if I told you it wasn't the point? That feeling bad for yourself wasn't the point. That reflecting on your heart's sinful condition isn't to make you feel bad about yourself. It's not the point of confession. That's not the point of Lent. Acknowledging our sin is not meant to drive us to shame. It's meant to drive us to repentance. So what's repentance? Well, repentance is a, is a word from the Bible that comes from a word meaning to turn around. It means turning away from sin and turning back to the Lord. That's what our reading from the prophet Joel that the vicar shared just a moment told us. Turn away from what you know is wrong and return to the Lord your God and confess your sins. Why? Because he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In Lent, God calls us to true repentance. So what does that look like? The first thing is, it's got to look like something. The Bible pairs this idea of repentance with turning around. So true repentance should look as obvious as if I was headed down the hallway, stop in my tracks, and turn around and head the other way. True repentance looks like walking away from an argument and returning later with words of apology. True repentance looks like turning away from an urge to retaliate. True repentance looks like getting rid of the temptations, the traps we set for ourselves that are most likely to cause us to sin. True repentance looks like turning away from my own preferences and putting others first. Pause just a moment. Reflect with me on a time when you demonstrated true repentance or think of a situation in which the Lord is calling you to true repentance now When we think of true repentance as turning away from sin and turning to the good and gracious God who loves us, then true repentance starts to look like the baptized life. And the baptized life looks like true repentance. The two go hand in hand. Walking in the light of your baptism means constantly turning from sin and evil and returning to the gracious Lord who claims us, forgives us, and keeps us with him forever. The baptized life, true repentance, isn't made to make you feel worthless because your baptism shows you how much you're worth to the Lord. He'd send his son for you. On Ash Wednesday, you and I are marked with the sign of the cross, right right there on your forehead. What other time were you marked with the cross on your forehead and on on your heart? Go ahead, you can answer out loud. It's your baptism, that's right. Now, Ash Wednesday is not a new baptism, but it's a reminder of the baptismal truth that calls us to true repentance and leads us in a life of following Jesus because it's hard to ignore this big black cross on our face. We see it every time we look in a mirror. Other people see it when they look at us. For one day a year, the whole world can see those who have been marked by the cross of Jesus Christ. But our baptism into Christ 
baptism into Christ shouldn't be just for one year. People should, one day each year, people should see us as those who have been baptized, as those who have been marked by the cross every day by what we do and what we say and how we live. And when they can't, we repent. We turn around. We confess our sins and believe God's forgiveness to us because of the cross of his son, Jesus. I have a friend named Edward. He lives in Liberia. That's a, that's a country on the west coast of Africa. This is a picture of Edward and his wife uh, this past year on New Year's Day. Do you notice anything about January in Liberia? The grass is green. There are leaves on the trees. And, and my friend Edward is wearing a short sleeve shirt and shorts. Edward is a pastor and uh, he and I became friends uh, when we were both studying together at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. When, when I was becoming a pastor, it was the winter of 2016, and we were studying Hebrew together. The professor had given us assi an assignment to translate one verse from the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. Come, now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Your sins, though they're, they're like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Now God has a sense of humor, a big one really. And that morning, St. Louis had gotten its first big snow of the winter. And by big, I mean like an inch or two. And here's Edward in class wearing three shirts and a parka indoors. He told our professor, I have a big problem with this snow. And we were all ready to hear him say that uh, he's not used to the cold or talk about how warm it was back home. And he said, I have a problem with this snow. Because for the first time, I can understand what God's word is telling me. He pointed out our classroom window. And he said, I can see this snow and it covers everything. There's no grass. There's no cars there's no roofs. Remember, this is an inch or two of snow. It's all white, he said. The Lord covers all our sins. Because before that day, Edward had never really seen snow before in his whole life. And he said, I have a problem with this snow. How do I preach this to my people? Because they've never seen snow either. Maybe you guessed, but we didn't learn any Hebrew that day. Instead, we shared with Edward, and Edward shared with us about sin and struggle and about the Lord's amazing love for us in Jesus Christ. We shared about those whom we care about and how we can bring them the forgiveness of Jesus, the love that would bleed for us on the cross, suffer and die in our place, submit to our condemnation, all to bring us his gifts, blanketing us with his forgiveness. As black as this mark is, the cross promises the Lord hears our confession. He'll make you white as snow. Pause one last time with me. Uh, go to your window even if you'd like. Look at the snow. The Lord sent you for Ash Wednesday. If you catch your reflection in the window, all the better. And see through Edward's eyes the gracious gift of God. A love that covers all your sin. Our worship will continue in just a moment.
this time we have the opportunity to come before our Lord with our prayers for the church. Uh, there is no time for us uh, without having anyone in the, the room right now. We would typically have a time for us to, to have prayers for personal petitions lifted up to the Lord. Um, but I will pause there just a, for a little bit toward the end. And wherever you are, you can lift up the concerns on your heart. For now, though, we turn to a prayer that is patterned after the Lord's Prayer, and each petition that Pastor Hinky and I will lift up is uh, pertinent to one of the the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Following this prayer of the church, uh, the liturgist, Pastor Hinky, will continue on with the speaking the Lord's Prayer, and we continue singing the the liturgy of the Lord's Prayer, the uh, found in divine service setting three. Wherever you are, I invite you to kneel. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, praying for them at all times. Thy will be done. Lord, In your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares. And help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayer. prayer. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. So that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear now the prayers of your people. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Oh.